Hi, welcome to CMSC 828T, Vision, Planning and Control in Aerial Robotics. My name is Nehir Shrestha, I'm one of your TAs, and today we'll be discussing quad-rotor hardware. Let's get started. First of all, you should know that I might refer to quad-rotors as quadcopters, quads, or drones. For this course, they all mean the same thing. Okay, let's talk briefly about what is needed to build a bare minimum quad. Like all electrical systems, we need a central power distributor. All power and internal wiring go through this subsystem. To power this system, a typical power supply is a LiPo battery or lithium polymer battery, which is used due to its power density and cost. We'll dive deep into each subsystem. For now, this will just be a brief intro. Next, the typical motors used in quads are BLDC, or brushless DC motors. And to control its speed, ESC, or electronic speed controllers, are used. For manual control and safety, a remote control transmitter and a receiver are needed. Frame to hold all of them together. And propellers to create thrust and fly. Now, so far, what kind of system do you think this is? An open loop system or a closed loop system? If you said open loop system, yes, that is correct. Because there are no sensors in it yet. Nothing to provide any kind of feedback. You might also argue it could be considered a closed loop system if we consider our eyes providing feedback and in turn moving the remote control transmitter to compensate for its movement. And that is also correct. However, in this course, we are focusing on building autonomous drones, so the system needs to be fully contained. So, what is the minimum sensor that is needed? If you said IMU, that is correct. IMU provides feedback on angular rate and linear acceleration, which will help the flight control software to stabilize the quad. Let's recall quad rotor dynamics. Um, in this slide, positive x-axis is going to be forward. Um, so if you want to move forward, you would need to rotate about y-axis, uh, so, and that's going to be your pitch. The rotation about x-axis that's tilting uh, to your left or tilting to your right is going to be roll and rotation about uh, z-axis is going to be your yaw. So if you wanted to move forward you would need to pitch forward uh, so what would you need to do? So pitching forward you would need to reduce the speed of the, these two front um, rotors and increase the speed of the back rotors. Similarly if you wanted to pitch backwards it will be the reverse. If you wanted to, um, if you wanted to move to your right you would uh, reduce the speed of these rotors and increase the speed of these rotors and vice versa. And if you wanted to, um, if you wanted to spin on your on the on the z-axis or your yaw, then you would increase the speed of counterclockwise uh, and decrease the speed of clockwise rotors and vice versa. And this is how you would uh, gain these kind of movements. Now I must um, let you know that in this course we will not be talking about fixed wing configuration, which is your airplane kind of configuration, and we'll also not be talking about helicopter configuration um, because the flight dynamics of helicopters are quite different and we will not be talking about them here. We'll mostly be talking about multi-rotors. So the minimum number of propellers required for multi-rotors is three, and um, they are called tricopters, and the convention will be using Blue will be the counterclockwise spinning propellers and red will be the clockwise spinning propeller. Now if you recall from your quad rotor dynamics lecture, uh, what is an issue with this particular configuration? Let me give you a second. If you said it is rotationally not stable, that is correct. Now if you recall, all the forces and all the moments need to sum to zero for it to be stable. Now in this case, because two rotors are spinning in counterclockwise and one rotor is spinning in clockwise direction, this is rotationally unstable. This is where quad comes into play. And in quad configuration, you have two spinning in clockwise and two spinning in counterclockwise, thereby 
being the minimum number of propellers to make uh, a drone stable. So that is, this is why quadcopters are so popular and, and most commonly found. Now here we have a plus configuration and plus because it has a plus shape and here we have a quad X configuration. Now, now all I did was rotate it 45 degrees but the dynamics of the quad changes quite a bit. Now can you think what might be the difference if you want to propel forward, what might you need to do in terms of spinning the rotors in order to propel forward and what might be different between the two configurations. Now if you said you spin this one slower and this one faster relatively in order to uh, uh, tilt forward or pitch forward uh, and move ahead then you're correct. So in this configuration this one spins slower compared to this propeller and this would uh, tilt forward thereby the component of the forces acting um, from all the propellers um, parallel to the horizontal axis or the axis um, that is parallel to moving forward is going to propel it forward, right? So this is how on this configuration you would move forward. However, in this configuration, um, what's happening is in order to move forward, the two propellers here, the counterclockwise spinning uh, and the clockwise spinning propellers are going to spin uh, spin slower compared to the rear ones and uh, the rear ones will, are going to spin a little bit faster thereby creating um, thereby creating a, a, it to pitch forward and it it propels forward now if you think about these two you can also think about it in the sense that it, uh, either in this case or the other case let's start from the plus configuration to the X configuration at all times you can think of it as it is traveling uh, at a 45 degree um, angle which means um, in order to, for this to go sideways this has these two have to spin uh, slower and these two have to spin fa faster which is our X configuration so that is the main uh, difference but just by changing that and calling this the forward direction your flight dynamics uh, and the math is slightly different now hexacopters same thing uh, by the name hexa six propellers uh, this is a plus configuration this is your X configuration now we always name the multi-rotor by the number of propellers so even though this looks same as a tricopter by having two stack by which we, uh, we the term we use is coax so by having this two stacks this one's called a, a hexa coax uh, Y configuration or commonly known as Y6 this one is just uh, Y6 reversed this is an octo plus configuration you have uh, eight propellers here this is an octo X configuration now we have octo coax plus configuration which is similar to the quad plus just it just has two layers and then we have octo X or commonly known as X8 configuration now uh, if you think about the octo plus configuration and the uh, octo coax plus configuration and the octo X and the uh, coax X configuration what is the main difference the main difference is the length of the arm can be shorter in terms of the coax configuration because the clearance required for each propeller is smaller therefore the arms length can be shorter which means uh, the uh, the forces acting on it uh, will make it much more agile but less stable for the coax and for the regular octo plus and octo uh, x configuration because the arms are longer it while it is more stable it is less agile similarly you have a uh, collinear configuration and you also have octo a square plus configuration and the main difference between a, a square configuration and your uh, octo plus configuration is that the length of the arm of the uh, counterclock spinning wise which are your blue are smaller than the clockwise spinning configuration 
and uh, so these are your configuration you are not limited to just these configuration there are many other but these get you familiar with uh, a lot of the terms that is commonly used um, to identify um, different configurations which are very handy for you when you speak the lingo uh, now the materials used for the frame the common one, uh, ones are wood plastic aluminum uh, and carbon fiber the most common one is carbon fiber because it is it is the lightest and the most strong uh, strongest material and the cost is uh, relatively cheaper as well um, and these are all and when you are trying to choose a frame for your next drone uh, these are the things you need to consider the dimension the configuration uh, the weight strength material price and appearance and all of these come into play um, come into play depending on what application you're using you need to understand the strength and weaknesses of each configuration and accordingly choose a, a configuration that best suits your need. IMU which stands for inertial measurement unit it measures angular rate and linear acceleration the sensor that measures your angular rate is a gyroscope if you buy an IMU with three degrees of freedom it only comes with a gyroscope gyroscope measures your angular rate and gives you roll pitch and yaw if you buy an IMU with 6 degrees of freedom, it also comes with an accelerometer. You can also buy accelerometer by itself, but on a 6 degrees of freedom, it comes with a pair of gyroscope and accelerometer. Accelerometer measures linear acceleration and provides the change in movement about XY plane and change in altitude. You can also buy IMU with 9 degrees of freedom. This one comes with magnetometer, also known as digital compass. It measures your magnetism and provides orientation. You can also buy IMU with 10 degrees of freedom and it comes with an additional degree of freedom which measures your air pressure and provides change in altitude. It's called a barometer. BLDC, which stands for brushless direct current motors, are the muscles of your quads. They are highly desired for drones because of its efficiency, reliability, low noise and they last longer than your regular DC motors. BLDC has two parts. First, a rotor, which is the part that rotates like its name suggests, and connects to the propeller. The rotor com is composed of two permanent magnets. The second part is a stator. This is composed of six coils. In short, the coils are your electromagnets and get activated when the current passes through it. The opposite coils are wound in such a way that when one is a north pole, of the magnet the other one is the south. This repels the permanent magnet and pushes them away creating a rotational movement. Notice that the adjacent magnets can be activated to attract and repel the permanent magnets further for better efficiency. For all of this to work smoothly some kind of computer is needed to know when the permanent magnet has reached a certain point so the coils state can be controlled to create a smooth rotational motion. This is the job of the speed controller, which we will learn about next. You can learn more details about the physics of BLDC motors in the link provided here. The job of an ESC is to control the BLDC motor such that it is jerk-free and continuous. For this, it uses either a Hall effect sensor or a back EMF to know when the rotor has passed the effect of the magnets that was activated and the inertia is starting to produce current in the coil that is uh, not active. At this time the state phases are shifted thereby continuously pushing the rotor in the direction of the rotation. The width of the pulse of the PWM or pulse width modulation decides how fast the motor spins. The wiring is pretty simple. The three phase connector connects to the BLDC motor on the other end, the two wires connect to the battery or power supply and the two pins connect to your microcontroller or flight controller board. Let's talk batteries. Typically for drones, we use lithium polymer battery or LiPo in short. Other examples of batteries are alkaline batteries, your lead acid batteries, nickel cadmium, nickel metal hydride batteries. But um, for our course and for most of the drones, LiPo batteries are used. Now understanding the specification of batteries, we're going to go through a few items here. First, um, in this particular example, what does the 4S mean? Each LiPo battery has a certain number of cells. 
4 stands for 4 cells of each of 3.7 volts, and S stands for series. You might also see P sometimes, which means in parallel. The 14.8 volts uh, is the fully charged uh, voltage level of the battery, and the power capacity of uh, 3300 milliamp hour. For example, in this battery, both of them are given 48.8 watt hour, and you can easily compute this by multiplying the 14.8 volt times 3.3 amps to get the 48.8 watt hour. The 50C, that stands for the maximum continuous discharge rate, and you can compute this, uh, compute the actual uh, amperes by multiplying the 50 times 3.3 ampere to get 165 amps. 5C, the max charge rate, similarly 5 times 3.3 to get 16.5 amps, that's the maximum rate at which you can charge this battery. Something to note about charging, you should never ch discharge it too low such that the battery cannot be charged again. And when you're charging, make sure you set the appropriate cell type on the battery charger shown over here. And then you also set the appropriate charge rate. You should not exceed the maximum charge rate. And also, um, it is okay to have it at a lower charge rate to slowly charge it. In fact, in, um, by charging at a slower rate, the battery gets charged better and has a longer um, life. Some of the things you have to really be aware about is LiPo is, is a explosive battery, so you have to be very, um, very careful. Uh, it is flammable. Um, it is uh, flexible, so you need to be um, you need to be careful about not bending it too much um, because the inside part might uh, either puncture, the, the outside cover might puncture or the inside might um, break and that might cause damage in the battery or a shorter life. And also you know, something you need to keep in uh, mind is um, always measure the temperature of the battery. If it's overheating or if it's overcharging then um, it can explode, so something you need to keep in mind. Um, there's something called storage mode, and um, you should discharge the battery to uh, uh, 3.7 volt, uh, not higher. Um, the battery can charge to a higher level, and it is okay to charge at a higher level for the usage, but storing, it is recommended to charge it about approximately 3.7 volts. Remote control radios are necessary for manual control and safety. Sometimes these are also called safety radios. The radios has a transmitter and a receiver. The most popular ones are Spectrum, FR Sky, and Futabo. We have Spectrum and FR Sky in our lab. Uh, some things to consider while buying a remote control radio is the number of channels, the binding, whether you require an additional adapter for binding or not, connection to the simulator, for example, FR Sky, you can connect USB directly to your computer. And the price. Just because something is expensive and has a lot of features doesn't mean you need them. Sometimes a $30 might be sufficient for you to get all the features that you need. Now, another thing you need to keep in mind is the wiring protocol to the receiver. Some of them are PWM, PPM, PCM, SPAS, and so on. What you need to understand that they exist different companies use different protocols. So it is important when you buy a receiver or a transmitter that they have they use the matching protocol and they support them. How to pair a receiver to your transmitter will be covered during the lab section. Beyond bare minimum there are many other peripherals that can go on a drone starting from the most basic one ultrasonics uh, range sensor which is used by uh, most drones to figure out its um, distance from the ground LiDAR to detect uh, obstacles, um, GPS to know its position, uh, and various other um, sensors listed over here. But the important one here is your um, camera that we're going to be using for the later part of the course. It is like a Swiss Army knife. We can do a lot of different things. Now here we've listed a few of them. Optical foe, VIO, SFM, SLAM, and so on. And this is the reason why we focus on vision towards the end of the semester. And there are other things such as the feedback from the um, drone to us. For example, the LED, a buzzer, some kind of display, maybe even a server release of some something you might be carrying. And uh, various communication um, devices such as uh, Wi-Fi adapter, 
Bluetooth, Zigbee, or even LTE, and so on and so forth. Okay, let's talk about safety and FAA regulations in and outside the lab. A few safety tips. You must always calibrate your IMU. Uh, always check the antennas are secure. Test it out without the propellers. Um, check the battery levels so it doesn't run out of battery in the middle of your flight. You must always know how to arm and disarm that particular drone. Know how to do the emergency land or if it has a home button, uh, know where that is just in case you lose control. Uh, this is typical for drones with GPS. When working in groups, always loudly and clearly communicate. Uh, and always wear gloves, goggles, and always fly behind net when flying indoors. FAA rules and regulations uh, you always need to be aware of. And you should know that there is a registration process for, uh, and I have provided you a link on the site. If you have a drone that is above 0.5 pounds and below 55 pounds, you must be registered to fly it outside. More than 55 pounds of drones are not permitted without a special permission. You should always stick the registration number on the drone and carry your certificate when flying. Uh, always use before you fly mobile app to check FAA uh, requirements um, based on your GPS location. Sometimes there is updates and you should always check before you fly. You cannot fly within five miles of any airport unless you have a special authorization. You should always fly below 400 feet. Don't fly directly above people. If you do, it has to be higher than 50 feet. You should always fly within the visual line of sight. FVV does not qualify for visual line of sight. And uh, you should always fly during the daylight. You cannot fly beyond 100 miles an hour. There are other rules, but these are some basic um, top highlighted ones that you need to be aware of. For more, please go to faa.gov to learn more. And that is all for today. And this concludes your quad order hardware overview. We'll dive deeper during your hands-on lab section. Until then, thank you and goodbye.